Oh, um, so have you ever had the experience when you make a significant or important or effective design change and then while you're away, uh, what? Well, it's okay. I can, I can press buttons over here. Um, I'm not going to use that thing. Um, so you make a change to a website or an app or whatever, and it works, and it's tremendous, and then you come back a few months later, and it's just gone back to the old way. And they've undone all the changes that you've made. So it's not, it's not enough that you design the thing. Um, underneath the thing, there's a whole set, there's a whole organization that has to keep running and ticking. And unless you understand how that organization works, then the organization will eventually take over and change the user interface that sits on top of it. So you can't just design the user interface. You have to go deeper. You have to go, okay, well, how do we change the organization so that it works the way that the user needs? And that is all very well, but that organization actually emerges from the culture and the values uh, of the business that run really deep. And so what you find is that you think that you're a designer, but actually everything you do kind of seeps all the way back down to cultural change. If you want your design to stick, then you need to be able to um, diagnose and change the culture underneath. And that's one of the things that, that we found over the years at my company, is that we start off with design, but unless we go deeper, uh, those design changes don't, change, don't stick. But the problem with culture is it's really hard to define. Culture is not about working hours, and it's not about the tools we use or, or how we conduct ourselves in meetings. I mean, it's all of those things, and yet it's none of those things. Uh, one client of ours assumed that changing the dress code would change the culture, and that seemed hopelessly naive. But he was struggling with this idea. When you try and pin down culture, it just kind of dribbles through your fingers. So what is culture, and how do you change it? But last year, um, we were asked to take the experience design team from a, a bank. Um, and that experience design team was small, and it was lacking in clout, and it was in need of skills. And we needed to turn that into a 30-person strong, world-class team. And when we, we looked at that task, well, we knew we needed to begin. We knew we needed to begin with culture. So we needed to be able to define the, def the before and after states of that culture. And we used a tool called the Competing Values Framework to try and take that nebulous thing, that, that cloud of culture and turn it into something where we could specify it and design it. And this is the competing values framework and I love it because as a consultant it's a quadrant diagram and I just love quadrant diagrams. And so you really define, define companies on two axes. Is the company interested in flexibility or control? And is the company's focus internal or external? And when you do that, you can define kind of four characters of company. The clan, the adhocracy, the hierarchy, and the market. And each of, those, each of those types of company is oriented in different ways. So the clan is all about collaborating, working together in a team. And the adhocracy is all about, whoa, what change can we make? What can we do that's out there? The market is all about how can we win through competition? And the hierarchy is about how can we exert control. Each of those organizations are trying to create a change in the world around them, but it's a different sort of change. So clans are trying to create long-term change, like we'll do things together and we'll just stick on that path. Adhocracy is like, let's create something completely new. Markets are about how can we change quickly in response to what's going on. And hierarchies are about how can we change slowly and careful increments. And each one of those is underpinned by a different theory of success. So each one of those has a theory that, well, if we do this thing, we'll succeed. And they're all quite different. And that's because they value different things. Clans value commitment, communication, and development. Market, uh, markets value market share and achieving goals and profitability. And really, when it comes down to it, culture emerges from those values. So with this tool, 
the competing values framework, which uh, you can read about in a tremendous book. I'll give you the, the, um, the details at the end. There come a whole set of questionnaires. You can use that to start to diagnose, okay, well, where is this organization actually coming from? And this is something that we do at my company every year. We run a survey and we actually try to kind of track, okay, well, where are we and where do we want to be? And we do it for our clients. So here's what that bank um, looked like. Unsurprisingly, the people working inside that felt, well, we're, you know, we're very much kind of driven by targets and there's this sort of market aspect to it and there's a lot of hierarchy around. And what we want is to be more creative and we want to be more supportive of each other. And with that kind of defined change, we were able to explain to people, okay, this, this is the culture that you have, this is the culture that you, that you need. We ran workshops, separate ones for managers and staff, asking what's wrong, what does your ideal world look like, what are the change, you know, if this is the change that you want to see, what does that mean in your everyday life? And we were able to take something very nebulous, very abstract, and turn it into something which people could start to understand as a program. People could start to understand as something that they could get behind. I think managing culture has two sides. Firstly, there's, there's leading by articulating a vision. And secondly, there's, there's guiding by listening and adapting. Um, and so with our diagnosis of cultural problems in place, we we're able to articulate a vision. But Culture, is operate, culture operates at a different level, a deeper level. Culture fundamentally is about what gets valued around here. Um, so you can say that, oh, well, what we want is innovation. But if people get shot down for having new ideas or when new ideas don't work, or if people think that they might be shot down when their new ideas don't work, then you kill innovation dead. The fact is that organizations often say they want change. They often say that they want these things. And then they demonstrate with their actions, with all those sneaky little signals, that they don't want these things. Which leads me to this. This is the most important diagram I have on culture. There is how we act and then how we say we act. And what you'd like is for these two things to be in alignment. You'd like these things to overlap, but they never overlap completely. And often, there is this gap between what the management say they want and what the management actually do about it. And that is the bullshit gap. Um, and people notice that gap. And it's the gap that people react to with cynicism, with withdrawal. Um, and so what you need to do is bring those two circles back into alignment. You have to make it okay to talk about that gap. You have to make it okay for people to say, hey, I thought we were trying to do this, and what you just said doesn't sound quite right. And that means that the most powerful people have to accept that that gap exists, and they have to listen gratefully when people have the courage to call them out. Making it stick. When I think about organizational change, I think about Cotter, and I think about his eight steps. This first six steps of, of Cotter's eight steps in, in making change in organizations are about creating urgency. You know, why are we doing this? Putting together a guiding team, a powerful team of people who can make this happen. Getting them to come up with a very clear vision. Communicating it for buy-in. Then empowering people to act and getting some short-term wins. For me, we have an incredibly powerful tool for creating change in the organizations which we deal with, which is simply bringing those organizations into contact with their customers, getting people to watch live user tests, changes minds, changes orientations, changes perceptions faster than anything else I know. The last two are about keeping going and making it stick. So with um, we worked with uh, an, another bank, we worked with Cooperative Bank, and one of the things that we did there was uh, to bring their compliance team into tests. And when they watched the user tests, that really turned them from skeptics into advocates. Um, we thought about, well, what is the compliance team's mission? Why do they exist? Um, because the compliance team weren't there to kind of destroy our designs or destroy what was going on with the user. They wanted to protect the user. 
And the problem is that for the compliance teams in a bank, very often they express that mission as covering the bank's ass. They express that mission as, well, we want, to put, we want to do what's right for the user, but we don't want to bring the bank into conflict with them. So let's avoid any conflict whatsoever. We use the user research to help them reframe that mission. We use the user research to give them a clear picture of what it was that the user wants, and then to empower them to say, OK, well, you're the compliance team. You, you're there to help us do what's right for the user. Now you understand what's right for the user. Help us get there. And so by the end of the design process, they were, coming, they were using what they'd seen in the user tests to keep the design team back on the straight and narrow to say, wait a minute, remember, we saw this in the user test. That's not what the users want. You've kind of veered off path there. Um, I think the most important thing, though, was that the honesty that being user-centered brought to that team. By making user research, what is right for the user, the guiding principle, it allowed that team to disagree, um, knowing that they could resolve arguments by bringing the user back into the equation. Uh, the next round of user research, if they disagreed, they knew that the next round of user research would help them to figure out what was the right thing to do. Um, giving teams the power to disagree allowing people to disagree also takes courage. You know, our teams put forward design suggestions that didn't work in user research, and we had to have the courage to admit it. Our client in that project didn't like the home page that we designed for him, but it worked in the user test. The users loved it. And, you know, what I admired about him was he had the courage to say, I don't like this, but it works, so we're going to go with it. Um, and when we did things that seemed counterintuitive, um, the client went with it. Uh, even when it seemed to be something that would, would risk, uh, risk his job. So, for instance, we, the cooperative bank's um, kind of guiding principle is, you know, we do what's right for the user. So, they and they're the ethical bank in the UK. And so we thought, well, how do we explain, you know, that they're the ethical bank? How do we explain that they're trustworthy? And we thought, well, we'll put, you know, we'll put lots of um, user endorsements on the homepage. That, that'll be great. Real words from real users. People will, will get that. And people hated it. People were like, well, you're just picking, cherry picking the ones that you like. We don't trust this at all. So we went back and we said, well, what's really honest then? If we're going to be the honest ethical bank, what do we do about that? Um, and so we said, well, you know what, let's, let's take all that small print that banks have and let's make it into regular print. In fact, let's highlight all of the bad stuff. So if there's a problem, if there's something where, you know, you know what, after six months, the interest rate on this overdraft will rise, we put a red star next to that and we said, you need to be aware of this. And people absolutely loved it. People saw that stuff and they were like, okay, this bank is being absolutely honest with me. And a funny thing happened. Not only did the, um, not only did the, the, number of app, uh, the number of people applying for those accounts rise, but there were more of the right type of people because they understood what they were getting. And our client, who had the nerve to, to say to his boss, well, I'm going to do this, while his peers said, well, you're going to get fired for this, he said, well, no, I, I trust this. I've seen the user research. I know that this is the right thing to do. So we did things that seemed counterintuitive, um, and, and it worked for the team. So taking what the user wanted as the kind of the core um, turned out to be the guiding principle that helped us to create change. I guess my last point is, you know, culture is like a garden. It, it arises from the choices that you make. And while you need to tend it and care for it, you can't fully control it. And that's okay. I've talked about tools for diagnosis. I've, I've talked about how we try to manage it. I've talked about how we try to embed it in the, in the actions and behaviors of the team. But for me, these are really ways of exposing culture so that it becomes something solid um, that we can talk about and something that people can influence 
Ultimately, though, culture is about engaging with your team, engaging with them every day. And so it's a task that never really ends. It's a garden that you just have to keep tending and pruning. Thank you.